This morning I was actually on a beach in Cabo build, doing yoga and building sandcastles with my five-year-old twins, India and Ziggy. So I actually feel like I'm in a really good headspace to talk about well-being and vitality. And I want to start by, by referencing back to Dan Buettner um, when he was looking at the Blue Zone Okinawa, found that beautiful concept of ikigai, which loosely translated meant knowing why you wake up in the morning. How many people in this room feel like they have a really good sense of ikigai in their life? It figures. You wouldn't be at a TEDx conference if you didn't have some <laughs> sense of curiosity and purpose in the world. Well, that's a good thing. And my, my, um, my purpose, in terms of why I ended up a chief purposeologist, is I feel driven to try to help organizations create a sense of purpose beyond making money so that the employees that show up for work every day can feel like their talents and energies and passions are actually used in, in the service of something that they can believe in and that they can take pride in. Because unfortunately, too many people wake up Monday morning and don't feel good about what they're doing. They don't have a sense of purpose in their work. And while it's great to have a sense of purpose in your personal life, in your families, in your communities, in your faith, at the end of the day, we all have to spend 40 to 60 hours of our lives every week at work. So if you can't find purpose in your work life, it's kind of hard to have a life that's full of purpose and brimming with purpose if you're having to relegate it to just your personal time. So in my lifetime, in the last 15 years, I've had the good fortune of working with some really remarkable purpose-driven organizations that have taught me um, what it means to have an organization that's, dr that's driven by purpose and not just, pro just profit. I've worked with Southwest, Air Southwest Airlines, which I'll talk a lot about today, Whole Foods Market, John Deere, BMW, some really remarkable companies that have understood it's a lot more fun to build a company that actually makes a difference than it is to build a company that's just designed to make money. So let me start by sharing with you what, what, what I mean when I say purpose, at least in the world of business that I come from, is to say, is this, the simplest way to put it is, is what difference are you trying to make? Why do you fundamentally exist? That's what we mean by purpose. And a lot of business leaders will say, oh good, I know what my purpose is. My purpose is to make money. My purpose is to maximize um, value for my shareholders. Well, if my mentor, Roy, Roy Spence, were here, he would say, actually, the only organization that is in business to make money is the federal treasury. They literally get up and go to work and make the money. They have big printing presses, it spits out. The rest of us mortals actually have to make a difference. And then by doing so, if we make a difference in the lives of the customers that we serve, they will reward us by giving us their money. Another one of our neighbors, I'm from Austin, Texas, and John Mackey, the, uh, the um, creator and entrepreneur that started Whole Foods Market, also always talks about how it's such a crime that for some reason, businesses have, have gotten a free pass in terms of talking about their purpose beyond making money. If you ask a, if you ask a physician, what's your purpose, they'll be able to tell you, I'm here to heal people. Or a teacher can tell you, my purpose is to educate people, or a lawyer in theory, is here to promote justice, or whatever the case may be. But in business, for whatever reason, you ask a business leader what's your purpose, and they just bypass the part of the equation that says, here's the value I'm offering to the world, and go straight to the bottom line. So what we try to do is get people to back up and say, well, let's stop and get real clear about what your fundamental purpose is beyond making money. I'll start with a real specific example because I've been blessed to have had Herb Kelleher and Car Colleen Barrett as two of my personal mentors for the last 15 years. And when Herb Kelleher, who started Southwest Airlines, started it back in the 70s, he didn't look at the airline industry and say, boy, howdy, I can't wait to get into one of the most challenging, unprofitable industries in the world and make my fortune. He actually looked at a marketplace which back in the 70s, only about 15% of the American public was uh, able to fly. It was kind of a, um, an activity that was reserved for the elite. Very few people could actually afford to fly. And he said, you know what, I think rather than duking it out for that 15% of rich people who can afford to fly, I'm going to focus on the 85% of the marketplace that's never flown before. I'm going to get them out of their cars, out of the trains, out of the buses, and I think I might democratize the skies. How's that for a business plan? And so he actually, uh, instead of getting into the airline business, 
we say his fundamental purpose was to give people the freedom to fly. He was in, he put himself in the freedom business. And that idea of, of having this purpose of giving people the freedom to fly has been the cornerstone of everything they've done. And I will use that as an example of, of how purpose benefits um, an organization and enhances the well-being of an organization because it should serve as a north star that drives everything that your organization does. So, Again, kind of using Southwest Airlines as the example, when they got very clear that they weren't in the airline business, they were in the freedom business, that started driving everything in their organization. We actually started working with them to say, how do we actually think about employee benefits through the lens of freedom? So we're not only giving freedom to the marketplace, we're gonna give freedom to all 26,000 employees by giving them the freedom to bring their personalities to the work, the freedom to solve problems as they see fit, the freedom to fly, the freedom to grow their career, Career, we cast everything through that lens. We developed products through the lens of perp through the lens of freedom. So, when it came time to develop a loyalty program, what's the biggest problem with most loyalty programs on airlines? You're not actually free to use them. <laughs> There's like two seats, two days a year on any given plane that you can actually redeem them. So we said, well, why don't we actually create a loyalty program that people are actually free to use? So we've got the fewest blackout dates and ostensibly you could have an entire plane filled with rapid rewards redemptions. Um, when it came time to uh, develop nomenclature, we said, you know what? You're not ramp agents and flight attendants. You guys are actually freedom fighters. And we're not just gonna launch new markets, we're gonna liberate markets and we're gonna throw freedom parades down Main Street and let all the citizens know that the skies have been democratized and freedom is here. So again, it gives these people a real sense of, of why they show up for work every single day. And of course, it shows up in their advertising that you'll hear, uh, ding, you are now free to move about the country. So it's told as part of their story of what's made them um, who they are. Again, with Southwest Airlines, another big ex um, benefit of purpose is that it really holds you steady. And this is a, a big thing in today, pretty much one of the only constants that businesses can rely on is that there's gonna be change in the marketplace. New trends come on that you need to worry about, what should I capitalize on this trend or that trend? Your competitors are coming on, doing all kinds of things. What are you gonna, how are you gonna respond? And if you have a purpose at the center of your organization, it gives you a real clear course to steer. So years ago when JetBlue came online and they had their Kate Spade outfits, very cute, they had their direct TVs, everyone in the, tele, in the boardroom was, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna respond to this? And at the end of the day, it came down to this very clear, not easy, but a very clear decision that we're not in the entertainment business. We're in the freedom business, and if we do huge capital investments in order to try to be like them, the best we're going to be is a worse them, and we're going to trespass against our fundamental purpose of giving people freedom, so we're not going to do it. So not an easy decision, but a clear, a clear one to do, and it's, it's, it's held them very steady. A more recent example has been with the economic uh, crunch lately, one of the ways that you might have experienced airlines are trying to recuperate those, their costs is by charging for Bags, every, well, charging for everything, but charging for bags is one of the big things. So consultants not too long ago came into Southwest Airlines to Gary Kelly's office and said, you know, you're leaving $300 million on the table by not charging for bags. That's a lot of money. And so Gary Kelly again said, well, if we're in the business of giving people the freedom to fly and we start charging $25, $30 for bags, again, that's going to inhibit people's ability to fly. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. So figure out where to get the 300 million somewhere else. And so we actually said, okay, let's not just let that go by. Let's actually embrace that decision and celebrate that decision. And we created a bags fly free campaign um, from an advertising campaign, which you may have seen that shows ramp agents tearfully sending their bags off and, and how freedom, freedom still reigns at Southwest Airlines. We're not going to do that. Well, as a result of that decision to stay true to the purpose and not do kind of the short term expedient gains of charging for bags at the expense of their customer, they've actually um, found $900 million in new customer acquisitions from people leaving the other guys and converting to Southwest Airlines. So again, it's a great example of how if you know who you are and what you stand for, it can help hold you steady when times get really uh, tricky. Purpose also is a great um, 
tool for fostering innovation. Just about anybody that's worked in corporate America has seen this explosion of innovation centers in every single company that's emerged. And when I think about all of the all of the excitement and passion around innovation, what are we going to do to stay on the cutting edge and what's next? It actually reminds me, we're actually sitting in a college. I don't know how many of you have seen kind of this classic movie, Back to School. Anybody seen this? Any Rodney Dangerfield fans in here? Anyway, okay, well, there was this one great scene where Sam Kennison is in a history class and he's going absolutely ballistic about the Vietnam War and going off on a rampage. No one knows what the heck he's talking about. And at the end of the scene, uh, Rodney Dangerfield says, great teacher really seems to care about what I have no idea. And that is kind of how innovation is today. There's a lot of excitement about innovation, but you're not actually sure what it's in the service of. Like, let's be innovative, and what are we being innovative for? So when you have a purpose and you're told to be innovative, it gives you a real um, sense of, here's why we're passionate about this. Here's what we need to be on the cutting edge of. And let me give you a great example. It's easy to talk about innovation with Apple and some real cutting edge companies. I'm gonna tell you about how Purpose created innovation at Procter & Gamble in their diaper division. So imagine you wake up Monday morning and you go to work for P&G and they're for Pampers. Well, you're told, let's be innovative this year. Okay, well last year, if you remember the commercials, they poured two cups of liquid in the diaper. <laughs> this year, we're gonna pour four cups in there. Next year, we're gonna pour a big gulp in there. I don't know who these babies are that need that much absorbency, <laughs> but it's hard to be innovative when your only sense of purpose is absorbency. Well, someone at <laughs> Pampers got the idea, why don't we actually stop and study what difference those, that absorbency makes in the life of the baby? And it turns out, I'm going to do this, I won't do this justice from a medical perspective, but the drier the butt, the sounder the sleep, and the sounder the sleep, the greater the baby development. And they said, so you know what, we're not in the dry butts business, we're actually in the healthy baby brain development business, the healthy baby development business. Now go innovate off of that. And so if I'm working at P&G, again, that became the springboard for all kinds of new products that they never would have thought of before. Their website was completely redesigned around this idea of Pampers Village, where parents could go and look at developmental milestones for their children. They brought in some of the country's preeminent experts in child development to post white papers that help mothers think about their baby's brain development and, and, and healthy development. And they also did a really interesting partnership with UNICEF so that for every package of diapers that you purchased, a child was given a vaccination in a developing country so that as a consumer of Pampers, you were actually participating in the healthy development of children around the world. So again, a really strong sense of um, um, innovation can flow from having a sense of purpose. So again, going back, that's, that's how purpose can contribute to some of the health of the organization. What about the employees? Well, let's talk about employee engagement for just a second and how purpose can increase employee engagement. Gallup has been studying organizations for decades to look at what drives engagement and they've kind of classified three people into three different um, segments. There's people who are actively engaged. These are the ones that show up, go the extra mile. You're kind of poster child in a, in a company for the go-to people. There's the not engaged. They show up, get their paycheck, do the bare minimum. And then there's the actively disengaged. Those are the people that kind of suck the life out of a room. You see them coming. They're like this black hole of negativity. That you, they're actively working to make your company fail. So how many people do you think are in an organization are actively engaged? 5%? Whoo, we got some cynical people in here, but not that bad. 5% <laughs> is good. Not that bad. That would be a really sorry. I'd have a lot of work. I would be in business all day long if it was only 5%. Actively engaged, still low number. It's only about 30% of the... Um, if, in companies in general, only about a third of their workforce is showing up ready to go the distance, go the extra mile, put their blood, sweat, and tears into the organization. 50% are showing up and just getting their paycheck, doing the bare minimum, going home, and about 17% to 20% are actively trying to take you out. They're there to complain. So what is it that causes people to be incredibly engaged in their work? 
Well, they studied that and they found that the people that understand and believe in the purpose of their organization are the ones that will give their blood, sweat, and tears to that organization. They're there not because of what you do, they're there because they believe in what you're doing. It's, it, it reflects their own value system. So think again, think about the, the Southwest Airlines example. Would you rather go to work for a company and say, I, I, I work for a company where I load um, bags onto an airplane on 110 degree tarmacs and don't get to hang out with my family during the holidays. Or I go to work to give people the freedom to fly. Like people are, that, that's more exciting. Or would you rather say I, 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 I increase absorbency in diapers? Or I am here to promote healthy baby development. Those are the people that are gonna, are gonna go the distance for you and that are gonna be more engaged uh, in what you do. Okay, so <laughs> oftentimes when we talk to organizations about, again, the, the, the value of purpose, they'll say, well, that sounds, again, that sounds really good. It's nice to have that kind of North Star. I need to be more innovative. It would be nice to have something that holds me steady, get my people more engaged. But I have shareholders to satisfy. I've got profitability to drive. Um, I don't really have time for this purpose thing. Well, there's people a lot smarter than myself that study high-performing organizations. Jim Collins is probably one of the, the better-known business gurus of our time, and many of you are probably familiar with his work, Built to Last, where he studied those high-performing organizations. He looked specifically at the organizations that outperform the general market on the order of 15 to 1, and comparison companies on the order of 6 to 1, and when he kind of reverse-engineered those companies to figure out what was at the heart of those companies that drove their performance, they had a core purpose beyond making money that drove everything they did, and they had a sense of core values that drove their culture. So there's been a lot of, uh, another great study that was done by some academics out of Bentley College, and they wrote a book called Firms of Endearment, looked at, again, companies that people love, that are driven by humanistic principles, that have a purpose at their, at their core, outperform their comparison companies by six to one. So purpose isn't something that's nice to do, that's a distraction from your performance. Purpose actually drives your performance. So how do you find your purpose? Uh, probably the simplest way that I advise people to think about how to discover their purpose, I would just refer to a really simple quote from Aristotle who said, where your talents and the needs of the world cross, there lies your purpose. Where your talents and the needs of the world cross, there lies your purpose. So ponder that for just a little while. There's a lot of problems in the world that need solving. And we're a talented bunch of people as humans with a lot of creativity. So thinking about how you can, uh, we can apply our creativity and talent and ingenuity towards solving the, the problems of the world is where purpose really arises from. I'm going to close with my favorite quote from George Bernard Shaw that really speaks to why I am so passionate personally about the concept of purpose. Uh, and it's from George Bernard Shaw, and he said, this is the true joy in life. The being used by a purpose recognized by yourself is a mighty one. Being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. Give a person health and a course to steer, and he will never stop to worry about whether he's happy or not. So as one of the cities that's embarking on this vitality zone, as you're doing all of the work that you're doing to create healthier citizens, don't forget to give people a course to steer. Uh, they'll be happy and they won't even have to think about it. Thank you.